Our next speaker is Sean Cleary, and the Wikipedia definition of a polymath is a person whose expertise spans a significant number of different subject areas. Such a person is known to draw on complex bodies of knowledge to solve specific problems. Now, when you read Sean's um, curriculum, you cannot but conclude that this definition of a polymath applies to, to him. I met Sean about three, month, uh, three years ago in München, in Munich, uh, during a celebration of the 60th birthday of the founder of the Parmenides Foundation, to which Sean is closely associated. That was the first of a number of very interesting meetings that all, that all fed into a growing friendship. In all these meetings, we had very inspirational discussion on things like governance and complexity, the Tao, and sometimes on the quality of the wine. <laughs> In each discussion, I learned a lot, and I'm sure you will today, when Sean will talk about governance at risk. Please welcome John, Sean Connery. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's related to uh, Tim Benton's passing me the poison chalice during the last meeting or not, but I shan't be having any wine with him for quite a while, I can assure you. The, the interesting thing about dealing with this topic at the end of today is the fact that roughly, I suppose, what we all expected has happened. Jan selected the group of outstanding people, I exclude myself, for the purpose of addressing different dimensions of an integrated and complex problem, which is how we deal with issues of systemic risk in a highly connected world where the pace of change is accelerating. And perhaps because Peter framed the issue so well this morning, I think what's been most remarkable about the discussions is that although each one has been on a completely separate topic, the level of systemic connectivity between both the underlying themes and the data and information that's been provided in respect of each of them has been quite extraordinary. And that, in one sense, makes what I'm going to try and say much easier. Because if we recognize that we face an array of challenges across multiple fields in a world defined by the existence of human society in much more connected ways, than that which we're used to. And we recognize simultaneously that the scale of knowledge out of science into alien has increased highly significantly and is accelerating rapidly. Then surely it should come as no surprise that decision makers of every sort, and particularly those responsible for national and multinational policy, are overwhelmed. If individual scientists working in specialized areas find challenges in coming to grips with the specific challenges in their area and cannot clearly articulate the solutions in that particular framework, how on earth do we expect a president or a prime minister or a minister of whatever who is at the end of the day a politician, not necessarily equipped by any special knowledge of the disciplinary area that he or she individually is supposed to address, and certainly not if you go up to the pinnacle in terms of premierships or presidencies, capable of doing the trade-offs with high efficiency. So much of the problem that I think we experience in the governance space today is actually baked into the system that we've created. And I think we need to have a degree of humility in recognizing that, because we're not going to solve the problem if we talk past one another in respect of it. So let's take a couple of reference points just to get going on it. You all know these. 
Sustainable development goals produced through an incredibly complex process involving enormous amounts of national and multinational coordination and discussion over a period of three and a half years. The product of the at least nominal success of the Millennium Summit leading to the Millennium Development Goals and then a desire to go further. It's wonderful. Anyone who doesn't celebrate the adoption of the SDGs last year, anyone who doesn't recognize that achieving that level of collective notional focus on what it is that we seek to achieve by 2030 doesn't know what to celebrate. But the truth is, the complexity locked up in those 17 goals and the indicators associated with them is enormous. And the ability of any individual to wrap his or her mind around what that would involve in respect of delivery against a global program, it's an impossibility. So it's wonderful focus. It's a splendid array of utterly desirable targets, and it poses extraordinary challenges. And the counterpoint to it is this sort of thing. This just happens to be the one from the Global Challenges Foundation, which was created by a friend who happens to be at MIT. It looks at catastrophic risks across the whole of the landscape. And of course, the two are very closely related to one another. Because in the final analysis, a catastrophic risk on the global scale is the risk of events or processes that would have a catastrophic consequence. Here it's defined as a deaths of a tenth of the population or have a comparable impact. And they both, ironically, derive from the same problem. High levels of connectivity, rapidly accelerating change, and the inability of policymakers to be able to wrap their minds around the challenges in an intelligent way. Now let's try and, at least on a meta level, distill what we know about what works. If you look at all of the faith traditions, all of the things that have founded great civilizations over four or five millennia, I think you can distill three very basic principles from them. The first is that there has to be, within any society, a degree of personal freedom. Because absent some degree of personal freedom, innovation, creativity, and progress are not feasible. It is not plausible that one person, some leader, some small number of people at the top of the society is or are going to have the necessary knowledge and insight to, in fact, direct the entirety of the society. But if that personal freedom is not balanced by some sense of obligation to community, you cannot have a society. It becomes meaningless to speak of society. So if you overestimate individual freedom and you discourage any sense of obligation to community, then there is no society. And some of you, at least, will be well aware that Margaret Thatcher, at a particularly unfortunate moment, made the remarkable statement that there was no such thing as society. She thought that she was producing a truism based on Adam Smith. She'd only read one of his works. The third thing is that for societies to survive, they have to recognize in the first instance that they're embedded in an ecosystem on whose functioning the continuation of the society depends for its survival. One of the curious reasons why we find stone monuments, particularly in the Middle East, in the desert, or in Southeast Asia in jungles, with no evidence of human habitation around these remarkable monuments, think about the pyramids and the Sphinx or Pasagad and Persepolis in Iran, or the many temples across Central America and Southeast Asia. The reason is because the societies did not respect the ecosystem at their peaks. 
And that is the best way of causing civilizational destruction. And one of the very scary messages out of everything that's been said this morning thus far is that if we fail to recognize that significant element, we're at risk of doing that on a much larger scale than any civilization has managed to achieve up to this point in time. So these three, for the functioning of a society, need to work together. There has to be an appropriate degree of personal freedom, a sense of obligation to community and respect for the ecosystem in which we survive. And actually, as I said at the beginning of this comment, if you look at all of the great faith texts, you'll find this theme running right through them. You'll also find it running through Aristotle's golden mean. So, how do we deal with this? That's just what we're doing on aeroplanes at the moment, and I'm a major culprit in respect of this. That's what we're doing in respect of internet connectivity. That makes it very difficult to apply those simple principles that I was talking about just a few moments ago, because the societies that we're dealing with are operating globally, locally, nationally, regionally, on multiple levels. Every one of you in this room has multiple identities, as do I. Every one of you identifies with people from your own community, on possibly ideological or other grounds, with people in many other different parts of the world. And the same thing is true in respect of your professions and your functional associations. So how do we, in that overall context, manage to balance personal freedoms, community responsibility, respect for the ecosystem in ways that make sense from the perspective of governance? Well, the first thing we can say is we're not doing terribly well. We're not doing very well economically, where in terms of IMF projections for this year, the advanced economies are going to grow by about 1.6%, the world at large by about 3.1%, and were it not for some extraordinary performances out of Asia, and to a limited extent out of sub-Saharan Africa, we would not be at the 3.1% globally that the IMF expects we'll achieve. The interesting thing is that four years ago, three years ago, even two and a half years ago, you could have used those aggregates in something resembling a meaningful way to convey some information. You can't today. The level of diversity has risen dramatically. There's no point thinking about the BRICS. India's performance relative to that of Brazil is a spread of nearly 10%. China's performance relative to that of South Africa is a spread of over 6%. And you can't do it in respect of the advanced economies, where the range is narrower, but the diversity is as great. If you break it down, the euro area is doing 1.7, Japan's doing 0.5. If you look at it in respect of the BRICS, you've got China at 6.6, .6, India at 7.6, .6, Russia at negative 0.8, and Brazil at negative 3.3. So the aggregates conceal more than they reveal. And therefore, almost irrespective how one creates communality in this circumstance, it becomes difficult to come up with policies that are likely to work across larger landscapes. We all know that we escaped from something that had the potential to be worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s by essentially pumping money into the system after the G20 had stood in April 2009 with their backs to the wall in London and started out by pumping $5.3 trillion into the system in order to rescue the financial institutions. Since then, in order to keep the system going, we've pumped ever cheaper money into the system with roughly 3.7 trillion of sovereign bonds currently attracting negative interest rates. 
It's clearly not a sustainable path, even in economic terms, long before we start thinking about environmental contexts. And the fundamental reason for this is because we haven't got a model that works for society at large. There's an indication of the interest rates. All you need to do is look out to the period past 2014 and notice that everything is below the line. If you have a look at what the IMF is recommending should be done in order to resolve this process, there's a suggestion that to keep the thing chugging along, we need to continue accommodated monetary policy where it's possible, develop accommodative fiscal policy where it can be afforded, and do highly significant amounts of structural reform in those areas necessary to get the economic system working once again. Christine Lagarde, leveraging her earlier prowess as a synchronized swimmer, has on two occasions, firstly at Jackson Hole and then at the G20 meeting last year, indicated that coordinated action right across the whole of the landscape is necessary in order to enable policies to work on an individual basis. So, given all of that fragility, given the uncertainty about what sort of policies are necessary to drive this forward, what conclusions can we draw? Never believe anything that portends to be a forecast of the future, including anything you're going to hear from me this afternoon. I can guarantee you that the numbers will be wrong. I don't know by how much, but I do know they'll be wrong. But broadly, we think these are secular trends. We think population growth up to 2050 is going to go from somewhere like 7.3 billion in 2015 up to something like 9.3, 9.4 billion in 2050. Accelerating urbanization appears to be absolutely secular from something like 54% to 67% of those numbers. In simple terms, that means there's going to be 2.5 billion more people in cities, 90% of which growth will come out of Asia and Africa. Rome's not going to get any bigger. Now, you can think immediately about the scale of the challenges that that poses. Not just the aggregate challenges on the scale of the planet in respect of environmental sustainability, not just challenges in respect of food security, not just challenges in respect of urban design, mobility, and related areas, but the simple challenge of how we're going to get capacity into areas which currently lack significant capacity, which have inadequate resources of human capital and relatively weak institutions, on a scale necessary to meet that particular challenge. And then we have aging, which has been referred to several times after Peter did it this morning. He and I are of an age where we can talk about this without feeling embarrassed. But the real challenge about aging is as we have rising levels of economic engagement, potentially at least out of younger populations in sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, and North Africa, we also have large numbers of older people, people over the age of 60 and heading for 90, who wish to remain economically active in some useful way. And how we're going to handle four generations simultaneously with limited fiscal resource and no real institutional capability of providing for that particular requirement is another remarkable question. We are on the cusp at the moment of the largest technological transformation that has happened to the world since the period between 1780 and 1860. The great industrial revolution caused a highly significant amount of social and political chaos throughout Europe, contributed very meaningfully to the displacement of empire the revolutions of 1848, and certainly underpinned 
the Great Reform Act of 1832 and the Second Reform Act of 1867 in the United Kingdom, fundamentally transforming political systems. It is entirely implausible that the scale of the technological transformation that we're about to go through over the next 20 or 30 years is not going to make our political institutions unfit for purpose and is not going to bring about something like the same sort of social and political transformation. So, that's all we've got. When we're trying to think about problems like this, that's sort of more or less it. So let's try and think about what we know. Well, the first thing that we can be fairly sure about, and I'm pulling my horizon back from 2050 to 2030 for the present, the first thing we can be fairly sure about is that the secular trend of the shift of economic gravity from the Atlantic to the Pacific seems extremely likely to continue. Will it be bumpy? Will there be shocks? Will there be setbacks? Yes, yes, yes. But is there anything to suggest that that long-range secular trend is going to fundamentally change in the course of the next 15 years? No. Secondly, and perhaps more dangerously, we've seen a trend over the last three decades where the rent distribution in the production of output has shifted radically away from labor in favor of capital. And the consequences of that are expressed in many data sets. Thomas Piketty and many others have written significantly about the topic. But the underlying reality is that wage rates in real terms for blue-collar workers in, for example, the United States have essentially been flat since the 1960s. And the concentration of wealth in an increasingly small segment of total society, both globally and nationally, has become greater. Yes, inequality has been reduced highly significantly on a global scale, largely as a result of China's growth. But the underlying trend in respect of almost every national society has been in the opposite direction. And it seems very likely that that trend will be exacerbated by this technological transformation that we've only now begun to experience. If you do not have remarkable skills, high levels of adaptability, access to entrepreneurial opportunity, or access to technology and the ability to be able to use it to advantage, it's going to be a significantly more challenging world over the next 30 years. The consequence of this over some time, with the likelihood that it will be continued, is jobless growth and social dislocation. If we take that one step further, we can start to see what drives the phenomenon of Mr. Trump. Representative democracy is not delivering what citizens have a perfectly reasonable right to expect it should. If they expect that their government will provide them with a measure of security, create opportunity that allows them to deploy their talents to good effect, then the circumstances that we've experienced at least over the past decade, and for certain segments of society the last three decades, do not live up to that expectation. If you look further to the effect that the Western paradigm, which Frank Fukuyama enthusiastically suggested in 1989 and then more enthusiastically in 1991 would define the rest of history, has not lived up to those expectations either, but that along the way, in that remarkable wave of Western hubris, certain people felt slighted, then the revival of geopolitics is no great surprise under present circumstances. And the combination of jobless growth and the return of geopolitics has accelerated rates of migration, both for economic 
and as a consequence of what has been happening in the area between Central Asia and the Levant over the course of the past decade for reasons of conflict as well. That forced migration is putting more pressure on national governments, whether democratically elected or otherwise, and further weakening the effects of representative democracy. Add to that the fact that the human footprint has now become so large that it is quite clearly at levels of existing consumption, waste, and the like, having a profound impact on Earth systems at large. It's then quite obvious that that problem will be exacerbated further, both in respect to forced migration and in respect of geopolitical competition. Now, this isn't to make you feel depressed, by the way. All I'm doing is describing reality. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to argue a case at the moment. This is the world that we have at this particular moment. And the fundamental issue is how we use science to better inform policy to be able to get to grips with the challenges that are baked into this particular system. But recognize it's systemic. You can't solve one part of this and then believe that you've made some highly significant contribution to the whole. So let's look at it very quickly. Broadly speaking, don't take the numbers seriously, but broadly speaking, these are the sort of expectations we have in terms of the shift from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Global GDP in 2000, US was about 31%. It's expected to be about 21.6% in 2018. China at that point was about 3.7% of global GDP. It's up by a factor of nearly five. The rest of it all fits into the greater scheme of things. Don't take the numbers seriously. They won't be spot on, but the trend is what the trend is. China, obviously, is not going to be doing 10 to 12. It's a much bigger economy today. No economy could conceivably grow at those sort of rates at that scale and size. But nonetheless, if you reckon that China is going to be able to stay in its broad range of 6.5 to 7, IMF estimates this year are 6.7, then under those circumstances, you've got to recognize that the US economy, even if it does manage to grow at 3% per annum, is up against a Chinese economy of 13 trillion, growing at 6% per annum. So self-evidently, the arithmetic would indicate, purely on the basis of compound interest, that it's not going to take very long before China becomes not only in PPP terms, but in real exchange rate terms, the world's largest economy. And it's investing in trying to make that feasible by deploying its surplus foreign exchange reserves, which are about 3.7 trillion, as effectively as it possibly can in respect of a variety of different instruments. This just happens to be the framework description of One Belt, One Road. But in addition to that, there is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank under the BRICS rubric, the Silk Road Fund, and a variety of other instruments that it's putting in place. This comes out of Parajana's connectography. It's a rather elegant illustration of what could be developed out of the entirety of that if you applied economic competitive advantage on a sustainable basis across the whole. Now, don't believe linear projections out into the future, and don't imagine for one second that this won't run into all sorts of problems. Of course it will. But nonetheless, it is a vision centered around China's vision for 2030, which is the shift from being an export-oriented, investment-driven economy into one that is more closely related with domestic consumption and spreading the benefits more widely throughout the region. It's also important to recognize that this reversion to the Pacific, this reversion to Asia, is actually just in line with historical trends. There's the point at which India started coming off its peak in respect of overall growth, and China and Europe started rising significantly. There's China's first peak in 1820 and the beginning of the rise of the West. Why do you think that happened? It's called the Industrial Revolution. 
And that runs all the way through Western Europe's peak, just before the First World War, when the United States has now passed it. And that runs all the way to the period immediately after the Second World War, where under the influence of the Marshall Plan in particular, the United States lost its dominant position in the global economy and others started rising. First Europe, and then subsequently Japan, and then subsequently the rest of the world. So, what about this issue of inequality that we were talking about earlier? This figure comes out of Credit Suisse's Global Wealth Report. I think you can assume that Credit Suisse's private banking division does not have any instance in pro or any interest in promoting class warfare. So I think it's fair to assume that the figure is not an overestimation of the difference. Their conclusion in respect of this, very simply, was that the total assets of 34 million people in the world are equal to 45.2% of the world's total riches. So 34 million people control nearly half of the total wealth of the world. You don't have to be too much of a profit to be able to figure out that that's not sustainable. This is why, this is out of Adair Turner's rather good book last year, but this slide comes out of his presentation to Cass a year earlier. Rising inequality in the top left-hand corner is a function of the shift of capital to income. In other words, capital reserve rather than wages earned is in fact the fundamental driver of this overall inequality. And that's a function of two things. Falling interest rates, which we described earlier as being an instrument of stimulus for the global economy, associated with the ability of people who have access to capital to be able to leverage such capital as they have at their disposal to enormous degrees. If you have access to capital and you can borrow money at 25 basis points and you can leverage it at at least 20 to 1, which is not difficult in today's world, then by definition you can get rich very quickly in rising stock markets. If you don't have access to that capital and you don't have access to those low interest rates, by definition you stand still. If you've also been in a position where your employment has been at risk, your house has been repossessed, and the like, which happened to very large numbers of people around the world between 2008 and 2013, then by definition you slip further behind. And that in itself might not be as problematical as it otherwise appears to be if it weren't for the fact, sorry, I'm getting this disease now, um, if it weren't for the fact that we know that there is an extremely close correlation between high levels of social inequality within societies and high levels of social pathology. So societies that are characterized by very high rates of social inequality tend to have much greater incidences of poor health, poor educational performance, a lack of well-being for children, low levels of trust, low levels of social mobility, higher incidences of teenage births, obesity, drug abuse, violence, and imprisonment. We can't, therefore, in the interests of any degree of sustainability, fail to address this issue of economic inequality for any longer. But right now, we don't have policy instruments in place to be able to deal with that. We have high indebtedness in the great majority of the advanced economies. We have rising indebtedness in China. It's only its foreign exchange reserves that gives it the margin that it has under present circumstances. And whereas we have relatively high growth rates in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa and indeed in India, which has the 
highest growth rate in the world at present, the ability to distribute that money effectively across society while maintaining economic competitiveness in the existing marketplace today is extremely limited. As I suggested earlier, that's likely to be exacerbated by the challenges that we face in respect of this great technological transformation. You've heard reference to the details. I'm not going to go into them now. But the really important thing about this is that what is coming through the research pipelines at the moment, what is in different stages of development, is coming out of infotech, biotech, nanotech, and cognotech. We have no idea how these technologies are going to combine. All that we can see is that fairly extraordinary changes in the entire landscape of economic production, distribution of economic goods, and certainly education is going to be occurring. This is a very quick overview. It comes from the Canadian Metascan of new technologies. That's what's coming through the pipeline. They reckon in energy, in agricultural and natural manufacturing technologies, in digital and communication technologies, in nanotech and material science, in health technologies, and in neurotechnology and cognitive technologies. And that's just what we know today. The pace at which new material is being published is completely unprecedented. Here's molecular 3D printing in organic chemistry. Here's combining it with molecular self-assembly. Here's a whole series of developments in emerging neurotechnologies. Brain-to-brain -brain interfaces are out of the laboratory. Self-evidently, this is occurring on an expanding scale in respect of the defense and national security space and virtual reality is starting to transform everything from tourism to individual experience. Now, the implications of this for income are going to be fairly extraordinary. If you are an accountant or an auditor or a junior lawyer, and I deliberately picked three white-collar employment areas, because it's happened across the board already in every country except India in respect to blue-collar manufacturing, your jobs are at risk. Once you have all the data captured within ERM, ERP systems, why on earth do you need accountants to write it down again in a different system? All you need is a piece of accounting software that translates it into whatever your audit reporting requirements are. If you have it in that particular format, what on earth do you need auditors for? A piece of audit software will do a much better in-depth dive into that data than the comparatively random sampling that occurs within an ordinary audit. Why would you want to do precedent search or discovery using junior lawyers or paralegals? The sort of software that we have available in respect to precedent search today is vastly superior to anything that you can possibly generate by getting teams of young people to work overnight fueled up on caffeine. So all of these areas are going to be fundamentally transformed, and I think it's to Singapore's enormous credit that this inquiry into how to fundamentally transform the education system in order to take account of the challenges that this transformative phenomenon is going to bring about is currently being undertaken. But all of you who are from universities or research institutes know damn well institutions are hugely resistant to change. So bringing about rapid change in respect of educational institutions is going to be extremely difficult. And we're almost certainly going to go through a very awkward period as we try to grapple with the social dislocation that these new opportunities are going to bring while trying to ensure that we change our systems and our institutions to make them fit for purpose as we go forward. So I end this little slide with a cliche. We're going to need flexibility, adaptability, social capital, and social cohesion 
in order to be able to manage these transitions. And if I could click my fingers and make those fall out of the sky, I'd be really impressed. But it's extraordinarily difficult to manufacture those, and it's very difficult to see how one will have anything resembling a smooth passage through this fundamental change if we don't have them. There are lots of discussions under the way about the implications for education in this regard. I don't think any of them are terribly good at the moment, but it's clearly an area that we need to be thinking about very carefully. And while governments are grappling with those particular challenges, we have to recognize that geopolitics is back front and center in the whole of the area from the Mediterranean to Central Asia, to an increasing degree in East Asia, in both the South China and East China Seas, and around the whole of Russia, but particularly Georgia, Ukraine, and related areas to Russia's west. Those are the areas of geopolitical tension across the whole of the landscape today. These are the ones that have caused most disruption up to the present, and it's unlikely that we're going to get a grip on them in any meaningful way that will provide for opportunities for post-conflict reconstruction in the short term. You all know, or many of you know much better than I do, about tensions in the South China Sea as well as the East China Sea. You know what's happening in respect to the complete, uh, competing claims. You know about the Seven Dash Line. You know about what China's doing in respect of construction, both on islands and in respect of other artificial islands. You know the challenges around the Spratleys. All of this stuff lies ahead of us. And then on top of that, we have the sort of interesting phenomena associated with Pyongyang. So spare bandwidth, even in terms of determining what you should deploy by way of military force, in order to counterbalance different claims and different approaches and different demands in respect of this landscape. Spare bandwidth is not likely to be available. Mr. Putin has the great advantage of being utterly transparent about his objectives. He was perfectly clear at the Munich Security Conference in 2007 when he did his speech at the Valdai Club meeting in December of 2014 after Crimea and the Ukraine he changed 14 words in a seven-page statement. He wants three things. He wants nuclear superpower status and strategic parity with the United States. He wants Russia to be recognized as a great power whose view on all issues of major significance will be taken seriously. And he wants to be able to control the near abroad. It's not entirely unheard of in great power politics. There is something called the Monroe Doctrine in the United States. It's a fairly familiar concept, but there's a whole lot of people in the world who think that shouldn't have happened after 1989 and 1991. It wasn't supposed to be like that. Well, it is like that, and we're going to have to grapple with that reality going forward, not least because of the fact that his popularity increases when he becomes provocative. His views resonate with a significant percentage of the Russian population. He has popularity ratings which are vastly superior to the popularity ratings of any Western political leader. And all of that leads to this rather charming headline where Mr. Brendan decided that the world was not in great shape. So, what's now happening in terms of the domestic level? The first thing that's happening is we appear to have passed the apogee of representative democracy. We have to start asking whether the instrument is fit for purpose in present circumstances. And the reason why it may not be is just because individuals no longer need political parties to mediate their interests in respect of having an impact on outcomes. And political parties are not necessarily very good at acting as intermediaries for citizen enthusiasm in this particular regard. The mere fact that the president-elect of the United States seems to feel it appropriate to express his somewhat curious views on a regular basis using Twitter is a fair illustration of the fact that even somebody who is going to occupy the highest office in the United States after January 20 
is not using political parties or formal institutions to communicate his views. If you have a look at what is happening in respect of these, the level of trust in democracy, the sense among, in particular, millennial generations that democracy is a meaningful way of achieving the fulfillment of their aspirations, appears to be declining rapidly. And of course, we can see the consequences. We started out worrying about Tahir Square and Taksim Square, whether we were celebrating them or regretting it. doesn't really matter very much. They were phenomena. But now these phenomena are absolutely everywhere. This is an illustration of the extent to which representative democracy is failing in Mexico. That's Brazil, as is that. And that, of course, is the Republic of Korea. So there's no part of today's world, for Peter's benefit, I could have shown shots of university students protesting in South Africa as well, but I didn't know you were going to be here, so I didn't put in a slide for that purpose. But it's a common phenomenon in every single landscape today. There's nothing unique about any part of it. And unfortunately, governmental actions are likely to be exacerbating this particular problem. Because governments today, as a result of both algorithmic manipulation capability, the reference that you were making to data analytics and the like on the one hand, and increased surveillance on the other hand, for a whole variety of reasons, ranging from efficiency in terms of process through urban conditions to counter-terrorism associated with classic surveillance, an enormous amount is now taking place on an algorithmic basis. Individual judgments are being superseded by algorithmic judgments. The United States does not allow people yet to kill without a human decision to do so in the context of a drone strike. But nobody's in a position to be able to analyze in depth the quality of the intelligence that has led up to that particular moment. And what is happening in this space overall is that on top of all of the weaknesses of the systems themselves, the social contract and the means by which the social contract is expressed in action is changing. Therefore, the legitimacy of both governments and potentially states is going to come under risk. So, there's no great surprise that we get a populist revolt under those particular circumstances. There's no trust in the system. Those who stand up and say what a lot of people are feeling are going to get the support of a significant number of people in respect of the citizenry at large. But the interesting thing about all of this is that populism has certain characteristics. Populists generally, Mr. Trump happens to be a rather startling example of it, but populists generally manipulate reality symbolically. They create stories. They explain how things work. They have protagonists, antagonists, and clear-cut bases of intervention. You can't tell complicated stories in this particular landscape. You create symbolic stories. Then you do exactly what's happening right now. These slides were prepared long, long, more than a year before Mr. Trump's election. But populists then create alliances. They incorporate key figures and groups into structural alliances that enable their legitimacy to survive. Most populists are not completely mad. They understand the story they told to get there isn't a basis for policy. So they have to buy people in. They have to draw them into frameworks, which are going to allow, at least for a period of time, some measure of sustainability. Symbols, not policies, matter in the context of populist politics. And if you take a look at the European landscape now, let's move away from Mr. Trump. If you take a look at the European landscape now, 
you can see elements of nativism and populism right across the entirety of the European landscape. You have populism on the left in Podemos and Srezia, Podemos in Spain, Srezia in Greece. You have populism on the right from Hungary all the way across to Denmark and Sweden. Obviously, Brexit is a phenomenon of this or an illustration of this. And it doesn't mean that the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. It does mean the system is broken. So what are the challenges? Basically three. You've got people who are actually anti-democratic, who are trying to significantly undermine the democratic system itself. You've got people who are just nativist, who are seeking preeminently to prioritize the own, us, above the other. And then you've got populists who are democratic but illiberal, who get there through democratic means, but then apply illiberal policies. And very frequently, as I've said, actually abandon the concept of policy in order to be able to achieve what they wish to achieve. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of W.B. Yeats, William Butler Yeats, but he wrote a remarkable poem in the end of the uh, Second World War. He said, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of in innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And if that resonates in the present, I wouldn't be surprised. My own view, for whatever it's worth, is much closer to Antonio Gramsci, who wrote powerfully, this is an Italian Marxist, by the way, but he wrote powerfully at a particular moment the effect of it was that as the crisis arises from within, I am a pessimist by dint of reason, but an optimist by force of will. And I would suggest to all of you today that in this period when the ceremony of innocence is being drowned, we have a fundamental obligation, whatever our analytical minds may tell us, to in fact exercise decisions to try to move it forward. I'm going to close out very quickly. That's what we think is happening in terms of population. That's where it's coming from in respect of population growth. Preeminently, an extraordinary rise of African populations and a significant continuation of Asian growth. Most of this is going to be occurring in circumstances which are going to put phenomenal pressure on the environment at large. The ability to have smart cities, intelligent cities, zero emission cities, and the like, when most of the population growth in urban environments is occurring in relatively underprivileged circumstances, is going to pose a huge challenge. And yes, Paris was a great success. And yes, as Tim has already said, even if everyone delivers on what they undertook at Paris, we're not at 2%. The whole idea of Paris was that everyone put their best offer on the table with the understanding that technological opportunity in the future would enable them to raise their bid and make greater contributions going forward. The question is whether we can muster the enthusiasm and the ability to be able to do that. The constraint is not technological. The remarkable experience of the last decade has been that breakthrough technologies coming out of Silicon Valley and Europe have been taken to scale in China and driven down price dramatically. The price of solar PV has come down since 2008 by a factor of five. And that's a function not of new technological breakthroughs, but deployment at scale. So the opportunity to address many of these issues exists the question is whether we have the ability to be able to pull our minds together about delivery. Those are those trends that I showed you projected onto the brain. The problem is the revival of geopolitics and migratory flows is going to pose huge challenges in respect of representative democracy. 
the interface between increasing returns to capital, falling returns to labor, the new technologies are going to increase the likelihood of jobless growth. Migratory flows, as well as jobless growth, feed negatively into the state of democracy, and self-evidently, what we can see in the context of climate change and everything related to that is going to put more pressure on geopolitics and, in fact, on the migratory frame as well. So I'm going to leave you with a question. Tim said I'd give you some answers. I haven't got any answers. I can tell you why things are so difficult. I can tell you how we need to think about how we're going to address these challenges. But I haven't got the answers to them. And the question that I want to basically ask is whether we haven't been guilty of an extraordinary degree of hubris in imagining that we had the capacity to manage this level of complexity at scale. Nobody in this room has got a short-term working memory that's better than seven plus or minus two random alphanumeric characters. Nobody in this room is capable of processing more than four relational variables at the same time. That's 64 permutations, just in case you hadn't done the math quickly. Right? So why would we think? that we were capable of managing this level of complexity at this level of scale. In one sense, the level of integration that we've engendered in respect to the global economy, the level of fracture in the global society, and the inadequacy of the political instruments that we have available to us to square the circle, almost guarantees that we end up in something like the space that we're in. Not this particular space, but something like it. And so the real challenge becomes, how do we think about this issue in a way that enables us to get a grip on what has to be addressed so that we can create the sort of future that we've all spoken of? Danny Roderick, 10 years ago now, I guess, came up with the idea that uh, we should step back from what he called hyper-globalization and stop creating these enormous tensions, at least in the economic realm, between democratic accountability at the national level and attempts to regulate everything at the global level. It doesn't matter hugely whether one agrees with him or not. I'm using it as an indicative example of the sort of questions that we should be asking. And I'm going to take it to where I think we are today. I think we have to reset. I think we have to recognize we've overstretched. I think we have to recognize that more of the same is not going to solve the problem. And I think we have to start asking ourselves seriously what we could get through on a regional basis in respect of things like ASEAN and the European Union, on a global basis in respect of international treaties and conventions, and what we have to regulate on smaller scales, and how we're going to do that without causing massive disruption and the collapse of the system. There's nothing unusual about systemic collapse, by the way. There were 313 boundary shifts between the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 and 1991 when the Soviet Union implode, imploded, and that was just in Europe. All sorts of crises are the order of the day. There's nothing particularly extraordinary about it. It's just that the scale of the crisis we're setting ourselves up for at the moment is much larger. And it may be time to start asking serious questions about how we take it forward. Meanwhile, all of the things that Peter started out with this morning are absolutely fundamental. We have to invest in insight and foresight. We have to ensure that we have the best information, knowledge, and insight available in order to enable us to make intelligent decisions. We have to brace for the certainty of turbulence. We have to recognize that uncertainty is the nature of the world we live in. And we have to create an organic ability to be able to anticipate rapid and discontinuous change, build trust and reciprocity, and build resilience that allows us to adapt and manage the shocks that we couldn't foresee. 
Anyone who doesn't do that, any country, any company, any institution, is going to be left on the sidelines. But the key question that runs beyond it is do we need to do more? And my last observation goes to this definition of resilience that Peter quoted Judith as highlighting in the 100 Resilient Cities project. I find the internet a very useful metaphor for how one thinks about resilience. Because the internet was actually created for the purpose of enabling communication networks for military purposes to survive a nuclear war. So it was engineered against shock. And it had certain very basic characteristics. Redundancy, distributed architectures, a condition of failing to safe, an autonomous character across all of its operation systems, premised on the fact that it was nodal and packet switching, not circuit-based, and then a series of formal communication and negotiation protocols. So if one wants to think about how to deal with things on the scales that we can manage, that's probably the approach that we need to take. But the much larger question is, on what scale should we be trying to manage and govern what? And that discussion hasn't yet started. Thanks very much. Wow. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Are there questions, or was it all clear? Thank you very much for this talk. I think the absence of question is just because it was so deep so that everyone is just digesting it now. I have a several questions, actually, but they are more like a discussion here. So with the obvious uh, problem of democracy that you represented very beautifully here, I think uh, it also resonates with the previous talks when people are, we are now, as, as it all, always was in the history of civilization, are so uh, concerned about the, our daily problems that we still need some representatives that will uh, think about global questions, as for example, you are doing very nicely and credit should be given here. Uh, very big, um, and probably democracy in, a, in this sense as a, as a political structure should move to this, to, to this direction. Not that the representatives of uh, daily problems, but rather than the futuristic problems that we do have on a, on a higher level on a higher scale uh, on, a global, um, on a global basis. This is uh, one question which I would like you to address. And another thing was, uh, um, well, maybe, maybe I'll stop here and okay. ask another one. I've grappled with this thing in a lot of different ways for many years, <clears throat> and I don't know the answer to the question. The only thing that I'm sure about is that societies survive and thrive when you get that triadic balance that I described at the beginning right. When you have enough individual freedom within society to encourage creativity and innovation and where, if you will, whether you think of them in the context of negative freedoms, as I Berlin's approach, or whether you think of it in terms of Amartya Sen's approach, it, it doesn't matter very much, but individuals must be sufficiently empowered such that they can, as Aristotle might have said, actualize their potential. Those individuals must not be encouraged, however, to feel that they are in competition with everyone else. They must feel that even while they are competing, they have a sense of community and an obligation to give back and contribute. And the society at large has to be mindful of the fact that its survival depends on respecting the ecosystem in which it's embedded. So now the question for me is how do you encourage through political and social systems, how do you encourage that understanding on a significant scale within society? And the real problem is that 
I think we did become hubristic from at least the end of the 1980s, the beginning of the 1990s, until the financial crisis. We reified markets and we deified the individual. And as a consequence of that, we created systems that were dysfunctional and which have contributed very meaningfully to the circumstance that we have today. The difficulty is that still largely the fashion. You're seeing significant backlash against it in a number of environments at the moment. But the space in which that idea that that is the way to go, ironically, is perhaps greatest today, is in the fastest growing cities in China, among the elites of India, among significant actors in Southeast Asia. So even as you've started to see the backlash in particularly Western Europe and to a degree the United States, that trend has still got, I think, a ways to run. Technocrats are not very good at managing citizen expectations either. One of the reasons why the European Union is under such extraordinary stress at present is because the idea that you can make rules across 28 countries from Brussels is not actually a very plausible idea. There's all sorts of good reasons why you should have common norms, common systems, certain approaches that harmonize relationships, and the deeper that you integrate, I suppose, the greater the degree of regulation in principle that you need to have, particularly if you do not have spontaneous normative coherence across the whole of society. But when you push that line of argument too far, you run into the problems that you can see in respect of Europe today. So I don't think we've got any perfect solutions in respect of this. I think we've got to think honestly about the nature of the problem. I think we've got to start discussing it extensively. I think we've got to stop engaging in completely counterproductive rhetorical excess, which is becoming characteristic of the political environment everywhere. People who claim to be attacking some other antagonist frequently are in fact undermining the working of the institutions on which the functioning of what they claim to defend depends. So a lot of this has become dysfunctional. We have to restore a sense of purpose. We have to get clarity on the outcomes that we seek to achieve. And we have to stop engaging in fruitless rhetoric for the sake of expressing your personal frustrations uh, at any particular moment. Those, I think, are the biggest problems within the frame at the moment. We're feeding populism by engaging in a continuous process of uh, antagonism. It's not going to get us to where we need to get to. But what the form will look like, I don't know. I think there is some possibility of going back to the Athenian agora in digital terms, and I think that that could be a useful complement, provided it is not unreconstructed referenda on a continuing basis. I look to Switzerland as an example of a society which, because they're not competing for office, because political office in Switzerland is a waste of time. Nobody would want political office in Switzerland. As a result, they compete about policies. And that seems to work quite well. But it has a particular history, it's of a particular scale, it's in a particular circumstance, and there's no guarantee that would work across all landscapes. So I don't know what the answer is. I do know we have to grapple with it, and I do know what we should be aiming at in terms of an end state. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, going back to your slides, I'm quite puzzled by the slide that you have shown, the global GDP, as we are actually only 391 days from 2018. So I don't know how this figure will derive. Uh, first of all, I'd like to find out, are they deterministic, heuristic, probabilistic, or statistics? Oh, there were statistics. The study on that particular thing was a chat so, art study done three years ago. So, because from the year 2000 to 
2018, which as, as I just said, we are only 391 days away, mm -hmm. or a little less than that actually, as I speak. So Japan dropped by 60%, and China increased 30 over percent, etc. And if you add all the figures on the left and on the right, they are not equal. And also, I'd like to find out, uh, you attribute to all those, the last one being the Latin America continent, so the rest of the percentage go to the rest of the world or whatever. So I'd like to hear from you where's the source of uh, the information and how they derive this number with 18 years apart. Because during this 18 years, even taking the last five years, the digital revolution with all the tax in place, it is not straight line, it is not logarithmic, it's not exponential. It's actually a funny curve. So I'd like to hear your view. Sure. Thank you. I, 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 I think I said four times. And if I didn't, then I uh, certainly intended to say it four times, but I think I did, that you should never take any forecast of any figure seriously. It is, it is in the nature of things that forecasting is an utterly imprecise uh, activity. Those particular things, as it says on the slide, came from Chatham House. They came from the Royal Institute of International Affairs. And it was a study that happened to be done in 2012, published in 2013, projecting figures out to 2018. That, that was the purpose of the study. It's an indicative trend line of what they saw was happening at that point in time. The reason why neither column sums to 100 is firstly because there are other countries in the column. And secondly, the other countries are not moving around to the same degree that these countries are. So for the purpose of taking a long table onto a slide, all that has happened is that the countries that were growing fastest or declining fastest were selected out of the table for the purpose of showing the trend line. The graph comes out of the original table, and it shows the projection in respect of that, and self-evidently the numbers won't be right at the end of the day. But that was the purpose of this study in 2012. That was what they published in 2013, and that's what they said at that point in time. No more than that. You'd have to ask them what they intended, whether they intended it to be predictive. I suspect it was the best material that they had available at that moment. They applied their minds to it, and that was the conclusion that they reached. Uh, thanks for that analysis. It seems to me that uh, the thesis rests on levels of it, uh, four levels of analysis operating at the same time, global, national, individual, and economic operating at the same time. Now, the way I understand governance is that it implies within its context ideas of authority. Is the point of your analysis essentially to say that authority will come from these levels, these four levels and others operating at the same time? Are you seeking to promote a form of order by, uh, in the globe by these four levels operating at the same time? Is that the point of the analysis? Let me try and answer it this way. Um, governance as opposed to government, you know the concepts uh, extremely well. But governance is usually expressed as the means by which we achieve outcomes at different levels. So we, we can talk plausibly about national government. We can't talk plausibly about global government because we have no institutions of global government. We do have institutions of global governance, and the sort of classic four pillars that everyone uses are the UN and its related specialized agencies, the IMF and the World Bank and the WTO. So, so this inquiry starts out on the level of saying, bearing in mind that to address many of the challenges that are being addressed within the framework of individual discussions, we require different levels of collective action to produce outcomes that are consistent with our sense of equity, sustainability, and progress, 
we have to have some instruments that would enable us to coordinate effectively as between notionally state sovereign actors. Not only, the thesis would go on to say, not only are we not succeeding in doing that terribly well under present circumstances, but our inability to square the circle between a relatively integrated economy and a highly fractured society at global levels is causing tensions which reflect also on the views of the citizenry vis-a-vis -vis their own systems of national government and governance in the sense of participation in the uh, management of their own affairs. So my, my thesis is the system is fracturing because we are trying to manage issues on an integrated scale, driven by a desire for economic integration, which was supposed to bring about significant economic advancement, but in the context of an unequal distribution of benefits flowing from this, we have reaped a whole series of negative consequences, perhaps unintended, and as a result of that, the system itself, even down to the level of national government, is now under significant pressure. Uh do you find governance a helpful term in this context or not? I don't have a better word for uh, the means by which we seek to achieve normative agreement on the principles for collective action at transnational scales. So if we want collective action at transnational scales, we have to imbue it with some form of normative framework, which is not dissimilar to what we try to do in constitutional terms at national level. And we do that through, I guess, three things. One is formalized public international law. Secondly, uh, peremptory norms of international law. And thirdly, customary international law. And then we buttress that with a whole series of treaties and conventions. And then we say, well, that's what the UN is supposed to do. That's what the Security Council does. That's what the IMF does. That's what the World Bank does. That's what the WTO does, etc., etc. And all I'm really suggesting is that we've overreached. Um, one part of the overreach is a function of the assumption that Western norms were universal. And that's been fundamentally challenged by the renaissance, if you will, um, of the Pacific, but China in particular. And... Another part of it was uh, simple stupidity on multiple levels, imagining that the application of military force was a way to bring about fundamental transformation in the interests of a Western paradigm, which certainly didn't work terribly well uh, in the Gulf and the Levant. Well, sir, <clears throat> you give us multiple commandments, but I refer to one, your last slide. Mm -hmm. Now... <clears throat> In regard to the Nodel system or Nodel factor, I, I don't know for sure no, do whether, whether you know that the possibility is feasible because we have yet to migrate from digital to bigotal. <laughs> and we're still operating on 20C instead of 21C, mm -hmm. even though this is 2016. The modality of entrepreneurship is still very much incubator, accelerator, which 20C, which is outdated. Silicon Valley working on it, Israel working on it over the years. And so you're right when you say entrepreneurs have got limitation in the question of the kind of real original innovation, which is not forthcoming in the, in, in the network side. For the past 35, 40 years on the network front, nothing really been done. Okay? Now, not really, you know, no real substantive because, you know, it's, it's because we work on a monopoly dimension. I don't know how you could expect the FCC is willing to listen to some innovation. Look, when Barack decided to democratize ICANN, until now, Congress is still pending it and it's still not working yet. Now, the question is that if you notice that... Um, kind of capability, do you think that, you see, we just witnessed just last Saturday in Singapore, uh, Singtel collapsed because they can't even, don't seem to master 
the simplicity of yesterday legacy IP capability. This is 2016. If you're going to tell the government how stupid those people are, no, they will not agree with you because it's a monopoly. Now, how would you suggest that there is another route that you can operate because the Europeans are totally negative. They feel inferior to the US, so is the other nation. So how would you want to overcome that? I, I have a very, very modest thesis um, in respect of this. I, I, I made a habit in the little part of my life where I sit on corporate boards, which is a very small part of my life. But I made the habit of resigning from a board if I didn't understand the business of the company or if I didn't understand its strategic plan for the next five years. And the, the reason for it was very simple. Um, firstly, I think you have both legal and fiduciary responsibility if you're sitting on a board such that you can plausibly say that you're providing appropriate direction to the executive management in respect of it. And if you don't understand what they're talking about and you've made your best efforts to try and understand it, then it's a good idea to get out of the way. And secondly, because my experience tells me over a long period of time that lots of people invent very fancy words to explain things that they don't understand. And if I can't understand them, then there's a risk that they're doing that anyway. So that's my, that's my, that is what frames my view of the nature of the challenge that we have. If you see that a particular system is failing on multiple fronts simultaneously, then you have to say, Firstly, doing more of the same is unlikely to solve the problem. Einstein said that long before me, so it's a much cleverer insight. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it probably means that the level of change that has occurred on social, technological, and economic levels has left the institutions behind. And therefore, institutional change is necessary in order to be able to adapt to the new environment in which one's operating. That's the only thing that I think I'm sure about. What I don't know is how to get from here to there. I think we have to scale back. I think we have to become far more humble in respect of the scale on which we believe we can operate. I think we have to try to identify the areas where collective action on a global scale is truly necessary in the interests of the commons. And it's clear that climate and biodiversity and related areas is such an area. And then I think we have to return as far as possible national discretion back to national governments in all areas where human rights are not being fundamentally violated. So I wouldn't take away a responsibility to protect. I would not uh, deal with pathogens and related areas on anything other than a global scale but I would try to limit the rest of this overextension to the lowest possible degree. But that will be much more difficult to deliver than it is to articulate. Thank you, Sean, for the insightful presentation. Thank you. More like a lecture, but thank you. Um, when you mentioned about inequality, did you, uh, by any chance, take inflation into accountability? Yeah. Um, I do see that based on that, then we should assume that the poor is just going to get poorer and the middle class is just going to get poorer. And we're never going to solve this inequality issues. Tess, going, circling back to my second question is that, would you see that um, the SDG goals will then be solved by the 34 million people um, who accounts over the one over 100 over trillion dollars when just yesterday, I read in the October report of Credit Suisse, the wealth, the amount of wealth has actually um, increased to $256 trillion uh, as of October 2016. And the third question is, would you see the comeback of dictatorship, communism, power? Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's deal with the last one first. The, the, the reason I showed the... Uh, William Butler Yeats and Gramsci slides was to say that when one loses control, when the system becomes deeply dysfunctional, when you are seeing a rise of illiberal uh, assertion of proto-democratic narratives which are cast in populist terms, then there's a risk 
of that sort of phenomenon emerging. Do I think it's going to happen? No, I don't think we're at an inflection point in respect of it, but should we be mindful of that risk? Yes, I think we should be mindful of that risk. That same Harvard study where I showed the declining enthusiasm of millennials for, for democratic institutions shows a disturbingly high tolerance of both military regimes and dictatorship among the same group. Now, I don't know how good the sample was. I only saw the report two days ago. I haven't spoken to the persons who conducted the survey. I, I don't know the detail on it. But um, I think that, let's say, institutions that have been valued for long periods of time tend to be called into question when things aren't working. And if there is a single message that I think we can draw from uh, Mr. Trump's election, it is that 67.5 million people who happen to have the vote in the United States are deeply unhappy with the way that we've been running things. Now, there's another 68 point something, or 69.1, I think, uh, people who decided that Hillary Clinton was a better candidate in respect of it. But the fact is there are 67.5 million people in the United States today with the vote who are deeply unhappy with the way the system is working. So under those sort of circumstances, do you get dangerous uh, outcomes? Yes, you get dangerous outcomes. If the system is not resilient enough to be able to process that and deal with it effectively, then the outcomes can become yet more dangerous because populism breeds an antithesis. The people who are, feel threatened by that which is being advanced by those who have acquired power through populism, by definition, start to act themselves in the course of all of that. And you can fracture societies remarkably quickly under those sort of circumstances. On the inequality issue, I, I, I think it's really important to understand there are sort of three things happening here. The one thing that's happening is that because we have deified markets and individual endeavor, we've created a circumstance where over a significant period of time, it became possible for people with access to capital and leverage to be able not only to preserve their wealth against taxation and a variety of other instruments by moving it around in respective jurisdictions where little was taxed, but in addition to that, consolidate their wealth highly significantly. Now, there's nothing wrong with the consolidation of wealth. But when, in a highly transparent society, it becomes apparent to the vast majority of people in that society that whereas they are suffering and having an extremely tough time, a significant number, small in, uh, in total number, but nonetheless significant in respect to society at large, whose lives and circumstances are showcased on television and uh, social media on a continuing basis are getting stinking rich and richer, then under those circumstances, the idea that you can have social stability and social cohesion surely must be thoroughly improbable. So that's the, the one highly significant dimension of it. The second highly significant dimension is that if we believe, as we sort of seem to believe, that sustainable liberal democracy is premised on social mobility and a broad-based middle class, which is sort of the paradigm, then anything that hollows out the middle class and anything that puts this broad-based uh, middle class under threat is by definition not good for democracy. So if we wish to protect democracy at the national level, we have to address challenges of uh, large-scale income and wealth inequality. That's normally done through taxation. Redistribution for social services is the ordinary means of bringing about a level of balancing through this equation. We haven't been doing that in Anglo-Saxon countries for a considerable period of time. And that has exacerbated this problem very considerably. In the framework of the SDGs, the great difficulty about the SDGs is that unless you actually develop coherent milestones, unless each government responsible for executing according to those particular milestones 
takes it seriously, and unless there's some degree of accountability, civic or otherwise, in respect to the totality of the system, they will remain a pious dream. If you can put those instruments in place, they will make a significant contribution to improving the overall state of both society and the environment. It, it seems to me that societies thrive when people have work. Mm -hmm. And work tends to be, uh, in today's world, um, under, uh, under many forces that are difficult at a minimum. And if, if, you know, large corporations, for example, in the United States help build the middle class, and they, not taxation, were the distribution of wealth. But because of the hollowing out and removal of so much of the work from corporations, at least offshored and outside of the United States, I think what you found was the distribution of wealth system in the United States began to collapse. And I think the election of Donald Trump in many respects as an American observing and living in Michigan, uh, what was going on could see the hollowing out of uh, the middle class very close to where I lived. So I'm wondering, what are you thinking about in terms of the future of work? Since I think the private sector around the world can play a very important role in the redistribution of wealth that we don't, as policymakers, often sure. consider, but should. Well, I, I, think the, I think the whole concept um, on which the United States thrived, at least in the post-Second World War period, uh, until probably the 1990s, uh, was premised on exactly the thesis that you're advancing. Um, but what is implicit in that is social mobility. In other words, you could come in, um, possibly with only a high school education, possibly as a blue-collar worker on an assembly line somewhere in the Rust Belt today, and you could advance, and you could perhaps get up to the level of at least middle management. You wouldn't have got to become a CEO with a high school education, but you could advance quite significantly in that process. And the second premise associated with it was that your children would probably have a better life than you did. And the last two generations in the United States, or the first two generations, where that just wasn't true. Right? The level of social mobility was extremely constrained. The cost of getting a decent education became astronomic. The level of student debt passed the trillion mark, and the chances that your children were going to be better off than you were practically non-existent. Now, that wasn't true in respect of people who had wealth. It wasn't true in respect of people who were lucky enough to go to an Ivy League university and get a good degree. Um, but outside of that, the more and more people were being left behind by this particular system. And then, and that's where the taxation issue comes in, there was not fiscal resource available because of the way in which the tax system was structured to provide a safety net under those people. So you got not only a hollowing out of the middle class, which was a function of offshoring and related activities, and technological transformation in addition to that because efficiency became the watchword in terms of producing returns for shareholders, but in addition to that, people started to lose faith in respect of the prospect of their children having a better life after them. Now, clearly that's not sustainable, and clearly that contributed very significantly to the dissatisfaction of the 67.5 who voted for Mr. Trump. The, the offshoring bit, I think, is worth just one comment, though. One of the odd things that I couldn't understand at the time that, under the Washington consensus, in the context of structural adjustment programs at the end of the 1980s, there was this huge enthusiasm for liberalization of capital accounts, which meant mobility of capital. What I couldn't understand was why people didn't understand that once you liberalized the capital account and allowed for investment anywhere in the world, jobs were going to follow. Right? So if you can invest elsewhere, why would you continue to manufacture here? 
And that, the beginnings of this diversion of the financial economy from the real economy, lies, I think, at the heart of a great deal of this particular problem. So uh, we've got to fix that. And I'm not sure that can be fixed within existing parameters. Paul Volcker, to his credit, made a serious effort at bringing back some measure of Glass-Steagall through the Volcker rule in, in Dodd-Frank. But frankly, it doesn't go far enough to resolve the problem. US banks are still not lending to SMEs, who are the people who create jobs. Yeah, they're doing all sorts of interesting things with the money, and that's one of the reasons why Wall Street has been resilient. But uh, it's not doing much for Main Street, and it's hollowed out the Rust Belt quite obviously. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.